of the clock. I sat in the shade in my flower garden waiting for him. I had hardly eaten any dinner, for I had experienced a strange sort of expectation. And it was indeed strange, for it was quite unlike the passionate anticipation of some days since in the prelude to our picnic on the cliffs. I was distracted and short-tempered with the children, but they and the servants probably put it down to the fact that I was counting the minutes to the arrival of the man who owns my heart. They forgave me, for I have acted in such a way before. But in truth, I was waiting not for my man, but for something else. Perhaps I was even waiting for his non-arrival. Now, as I look back through my tears, I am afraid, very afraid, of my own power to predict. And in recognising this, I am even more afraid that my fears and premonitions have somehow influenced the course of events. Could I, through my own doubts, have caused cruel fate to take him away from me? My hand is shaking, and I can hardly write. But I must try, for the sake of my own sanity, and in an attempt to banish the blackness within my soul. Perhaps he will come back to me tomorrow. I must wish it, I must will it. Please, God, make it happen, for I need Owain, and I want him more than anything on the surface of this sweet and bitter earth. By five minutes past the hour, I knew that something was wrong. Owain is never late. But now he was late. I waited until half past the hour, refusing to leave my seat beneath the golden blossoms of my laburnum tree. I knew that if I left the garden, I would be prowling about the place like a mad thing, spreading alarm and despondency in all directions. At last I could wait no longer and walk to the house. Luckily the children were not there. Liza was breastfeeding Brunach in the kitchen. Liza, I whispered, Master Owain has not come. I can see that, Mistress Martha. You look as if you've seen a ghost. Please, you must sit down and try not to worry. Maybe he has been delayed by some domestic problem and will be here soon. Then Bessie came in and saw the state I was in and sat me down and gave me a drink of water. Then she gave me a good scolding. Mistress, you must not allow wild fantasies to sweep you away. Master Owain is, after all, only half an hour late, and that is surely nothing to worry about. Half an hour to you, Bessie, but a century to me. Something terrible has happened to him, I know it. Will you please ask Will to go down to Llanach and find out where he is? And so Will was sent. And while he was away, I became so distressed that I had to go up to my room and lie down. At last, with my heart pounding, I heard Will's heavy footsteps returning across the yard. I was at the kitchen door to meet him. Well, what is the news? was all that I could say. Will frowned, for he is not very good at hiding his feelings. My heart sank even further before he said a word. Mistress, more than a little concerned they are down at Lanach. Master Owain should have been back there for dinner at noon. With the weather still calm and warm, he told them this morning that he was to call and see you after dinner. But before that, he said he was minded to go out into the bay and see if he could catch some nice fresh mackerel for you. In early this year they are, so they say. Spare me the details, Will. What next? Well, mistress, they says that he set off very early at about six of the clock on his hunter, as happy as can be. Heading for Cummeraglois, where he keeps his boat and his fishing lines. Quite correct, mistress. At any rate, they are also worried about the fact that he has not returned, and Mistress Gwillem says that two of the Llanach manservants have gone down on their ponies indeed to see if they can find out what has happened to him. But there is no wind, and the sea is still as flat as a farm pond. Surely nothing untoward can happen, with conditions as they are. My thoughts exactly, mistress, 
Very strange indeed, since Master Owine is quite an experienced boatman, and him and me have talked of the joys of fishing in the bay on many jolly occasions. Please do not remind me of jolly occasions just now, Will. Can you not see that I am desperately worried? We have to find out what has happened ourselves. I want you and Billy to take the two fastest ponies and to get down to Cumareglois as soon as possible. Go over the mountain, for the track is hard and dry just now. God willing, you will find him near the beach, or at least discover some news of him. And so they went, and returned late in the evening, by which time I had been reduced to such a state of terror that Bessie had to sit with me at my bedside. She gave me something to calm my nerves and to make me drowsy while Sean and the old people kept the children occupied downstairs and in the nursery. They should have been asleep, but they too were restless and worried. At last, Billy and Will came up the stairs, looking utterly dejected. Mistress, said Billy, I fear that the news is not good. And I heard them out, feeling as I did when news of David's death was delivered to me on a fateful day in February two years ago. At first I was paralysed, and then I wept. It is past midnight, and I am still weeping 